So hopefully I've sold you at this point about why we would want to learn uh, HTML and use it to make apps. And I've got, I'm going to be providing you with a variety of instruction sheets that take you to the whole process. Most of the time that we'll spend today will be about the basic setup of our development environment. We're not probably going to get into any coding today. There'll be time for that. But we just need to set up the software. So from the network folder, I'll remind you where that is in just a moment, we have three sheets of instructions. If you lost the network folder, it's in computer. We have a network location, drive Z, Z as in zebra. So you want to open classroom data drive Z and scroll down to my folder, which is campus Android 2. If you open campus Android 2, we looked at the syllabus, and now if you have not done so yet, you want a copy of instruction 1, 2, and 2B. I've turned off the printer at the moment, so you can print during the next break, but I'm going to drag those to my desktop. You should drag yours to your desktop or your flash drive. Anyone bring a flash drive today? If you didn't, that's okay. Maybe bring one next time because you'll probably want to take your work with you at the end of the day. You cannot save your work to our computers. When you turn them off, it'll erase everything, go back to factory settings. So you have to remember to take your work with you on a USB drive. And our projects are going to be about 20 megabytes or so. So you can't quite email it to yourself, maybe. Uh, so I would bring a flash drive. You're not going to be able to save them on our computer reliably. <clears throat> At the end of the day, I will put in a copy of my work into the network folder so that you can take it if you'd like, so you can compare if you went wrong somewhere. You can check my code against yours. But at the moment, I've got three instructions for you. We'll look at number one. Notice it says Campus 1 Java and Campus 2A or to Android, and to be use Android Studio. So if you open the first one, Campus 1 Java Ant, some of these things, the first couple of sheets, are going to be pretty informational because all of the software is already installed here. We would be spending all our time downloading the software and installing it, all for naught, because then when you restarted the computer, it would erase. So all the software is already installed. I'm going to go through this in general. If you want to do any of this on your own computer, your own laptop here, or at home, all the instructions are here. I've tested them step by step just a couple of days ago again. So this all should work on Windows or Mac. In general, we're going to need the Java Development Kit software. This is not the regular Java, um, what's the other version called, the regular Java runtime the one that you need to see websites. This is the Java development kit. Even though we're not going to write Java code to create our software, we still need Java because it's our foundation of, on which we're going to build on. Just like this building has a foundation, we need a foundation for our apps and it's still going to be Java. So in here I talk about going to the website. Again, you don't need to do this, it's already installed. But at home you would go to the website, go to this screen and download Java Development Kit, the JDK version 845. I haven't checked it since a couple of days. It might already be on 846. I haven't checked. But you want to get the latest version. You want to install, download it and install it. And then it's set up. Uh, if you're on Windows, you have to check if you want the x86 version, the 32-bit version, or the 64-bit version. If you don't know what kind of computer you have, you'll be safe getting the 32-bit version. If your computer has more than 4 gigabytes of RAM, it probably is 64-bit. So you want the 64-bit. So you're going to download it, you're going to install it. By default, it's going to install in your Program Files folder. And then this is always an issue that, that happens to people. You've installed the software, but it still doesn't quite work. That's because it possibly did not add itself to your environment path. There's so much software on your computer, but all of it isn't as <clears throat> readily accessible as you would think. So I've got instructions here on Windows to set your environment path, to tell Windows this is where Java is installed, so that when we need to use it, it'll work. 
when I was first starting to teach this particular class two or two and a half years ago, this was the number one pe problem people were having at home. They would tell me, why doesn't it work? I followed your instructions perfectly. Then I had to do the research and look up on forums and started to find out. Sometimes this environment does not set itself. We'll be able to tell if this works or not in just a bit. But this is how you set your path. Again, you don't need to do this here. We've done it. The other piece of software is something called Apache Ant. This is another piece of the puzzle that will convert our HTML project into an Android project. You would get this over at ant.apache.org, and there's a download button. Now, Apache.org is one of the big important companies or organizations of the internet. They're behind a lot of great open source software, and Ant is one of them. So as of this writing, a couple of days ago when I updated this, it's on version 1.96. It was on version 195 about three weeks ago, and there must have been something wrong with it because then they released 196 relatively quickly. They were on version 194 for like a year. Um, but anyway, 196 is the latest version. This does not have an installation file. It's just a big old zip file. So you have to unzip it somewhere to your hard drive. And I'm recommending here, just put it on the C drive. Don't put it in program folder or whatever, just put it on the C drive, any name you want, but I'm just using the default name. Because there's no installation file or, or wizard, you definitely then have to set the path to tell Windows, to tell Cordova, this is where Ant is so that my project runs. And all the instructions are here. I'm not going to do them. Uh, it's already set up on our computers. But you set the path and then now Cordova and Windows will know that you've got Java and Ant. To confirm this, what we're going to do is we're going to use Cordova. And Cordova, the newest versions, versions 3 and up, relied on the command line to get the work done. How many of you know what the command line is? few people. If you don't know what it is, it's the opposite of what we're looking at here. We're looking at a start menu, and we're looking at buttons, and we can drag a folder, and we've got this metaphor of a desktop and all of that. Well, in the old days, this is what we had. Right? We had CD desktop DIR open folder. This is the command line. DOS this operating system. We're going to use this um, in our class. Maybe you've never used this in your life. That's fine. We're going to learn the four or five commands necessary to manage. <coughs> we don't need to learn everything about this. I've got them all on my sheets, the important ones. Because we will be able to write a couple of commands, Cordova build Android, and it will turn your app, your, your HTML code into an Android app be able to write Cordova build iOS and it'll turn it into an iPhone app. Or we'll be able to write simply Cordova build and it'll do them all at once. And yeah, maybe one day they will design a version where you click on start menu and you click on programs and you click on Cordova and it's a nice pretty interface. But for our purposes, a couple of commands is all we need. You know, six commands. No big deal. And it's all in my instructions. So if you've never really used the command line, you'll be fine. But if you have used it before, good. If you haven't used it in a while, it'll all come back to you. But what I want to do to get us a little acclimated to this, this stuff is already installed, and we're going to confirm that it's installed by getting a little practice with the command line. So on your start menu here, I'll tell you how on the Mac in a moment. If you click on start, and under search, you start typing command line. You should see a couple of them. Uh, let's just go simply to command prompt. If you're on the Mac, uh, I guess the easiest way is to go to your spotlight search and search for terminal. Terminal is their version of, is the Mac version of command prompt. So just go to your spotlight search and search terminal. Or go to your apps and then utilities, and then you'll find terminal. 
But on Windows here, go ahead and search command prompt and turn on the command prompt. And here's a, a window, command prompt. In the old days, you had to know all the commands, or you have to have a really thick book that had them all here, and you had to look them up to see what you needed to type. But for us, let's just type this. Let's type Java space dash version. So I'm saying, let's run Java. What version do we have? Press Enter. Nothing happens until you press Enter. Java space dash version. There's no space next to the dash. And you get a result. Java version 18045. Java SE runtime build whatever. Java hotspot 64-bit. Okay, so we've got Java installed. Does anyone have any different number than me? Someone that does not have 45 on our computers. They all should be exactly the same. So once you write Java dash version, that's our Java version. Okay, let's check our version of ant. ANT space dash version. And press enter. Apache Ant version 194. Hmm. Do you have 194 also? Okay, so we don't have 196 in this room. We'll be fine. We don't have the latest version, but we'll be fine. When you go home and you install this, you'll have the latest version. There should not be any issues that we've got an older version. We're not going to be able to update the latest version here anyway because it's got the protection that if you make any changes, it'll just go back to 194. So don't worry, but at home, you'll have 196 if you set this up today. Okay, so we check what versions of uh, Java and Ant that we have. What we've got here is, this says that I'm on the C drive in my users folder in my account instructor. Yours probably says C users lab right? You're the lab user. And we're currently in the folder of lab. Type dir, press enter, that means show me the directory, show me the folder, what's in this folder. Because obviously if I open a, a window in computer it shows me all the pretty folders and icons and graphics. We're not going to see that in the command prompt. Type dir to see the directory, to see the folder. And it shows here a bunch of stuff, but it shows there's my desktop folder, there's my documents folder, my downloads folder. It shows me down here that this is my hard drive and it's still got 214 billion bytes free. 21 directories. Well, I want to go to the desktop. I want to open my desktop folder in the command prompt. I can see a folder with dir, directory. Show me the directory. To change into that directory, we type cd, space, that's change directory. Again, this will be in one of my handouts in a moment, but we'll do it this way first. Change directory, and then the name of the directory, desktop. Technically, you don't have to put the capital letter. or you could. Let's change directory to the desktop. CD space desktop. Press enter. And then you say, okay, great, we're in the desktop. How do I see what's on the desktop again? DIR. Show me the directory. What's on the directory on the desktop? Oh, there's my PDF. My PDFs. And there's a link to Photoshop. <coughs> so CD is to change directories. We've gone into the desktop directory. Uh, and I'm looking at a bunch of files on my desktop. Are any of these folders? 
Can you tell? Well, I can tell if I'm looking in Windows, obviously. I've got some folders on my desktop. There's a folder. There's the icon of the folder. But can you tell if there's a folder through the command prompt? Yeah. Those that are marked as directories. <coughs> so there's an Ubuntu directory. There's an RGISO's directory or folder. And there's a couple over there. So I want to go into the Ubuntu directory, the Ubuntu folder. So cd ubuntu and then it enter and then it tells me okay I'm in the ubuntu folder dir to see what's inside of it and it's a bunch of virtual disks and such so okay I'm in a folder I've gone into a folder great I mastered that how do I get out of this folder how do I go back well cd Change directory to what? Well, you know what you're doing. So dot dot. That's a shorthand to take us back one level. So cd space dot dot. Because technically, look at the very top. We have a directory dot and a directory dot dot. The single dot is the current directory. How would you ever know? I'm telling you right now. But um, then dot dot is the previous directory. So wherever you're at, you're always going to have a previous directory, except if you're on the root. And so here I want to go back one directory. So cd space dot dot enter. Now I'm back to the desktop. Okay, now I want to get out of the desktop and go back to instructor. So I can do again cd space dot dot. And now I'm in the instructor directory. Well, I want to go all the way back to the top level of the C drive. I want to get out of instructor, out of users, and to the C drive level. CD dot dot backslash dot dot. Does that work? Yes. So um, CD dot dot takes me back one level. Backslash back one level. That's a backslash. We're used to typing HTTP colon slash slash forward slash. Here we need to type a backslash, which is above your enter key. Backslash. So if you ever hear on TV or the radio, visit our website. HTTP colon backslash backslash. Turn off that ad because they don't know what they're talking about. HTTP colon slash slash is what a real website is. You don't see backslashes on websites. Here in the command prompt, we use the backslash. And so here I say, go back one directory and go back another directory, and I'm back on the C drive, the top level. And notice it just says C backslash. Did you see the backslashes in between the directories? Now it should make sense. What's in your C drive? 14 files, 21 directories. There's a WordPress folder, there's a Windows folder, there's an untitled JPEG file, etc. Can we make like a double um, screen where you can see top to bottom and don't have to scroll down? You could click the expand button up here and it will expand and give you a larger vertical size. Uh, there's a certain limit that you can expand it horizontally though. It only goes a certain width. That's just the way it goes. You can't fix that. But if you click the top button up here, the Maximize button, it's just like a window like any other Windows app. So if you click that Maximize, it should pop open as vertical as possible. And you have the ability to scroll back also. So that might be useful. Expand your your, your your window, click maximize there, and you'll get a bigger area to look at. So we're going to be using the command prompt pretty extensively. And if you've never used this before, this is obviously totally alien. We're used to the modern way of clicking on an icon and dragging and so forth. I'm not going to really talk about, okay, now moving a file and renaming a file. We're not going to need to get that far. We're really just going to need to use the DOS window, the command prompt, to change directories, 
And when we start to learn about Cordova, there will be a whole set of Cordova commands. As a quick preview, type Cordova. Press Enter. Here's all possible Cordova commands. We'll look at that in detail later. But typing Cordova gives you a synopsis. Cordova create, Cordova <coughs> info, etc. We'll do that later. For the moment, the main things you need to know are DIR, which shows you a directory. If you type in the wrong command, it'll give you some sort of error. Like if I typed, uh, you know, dir thing, there's no such thing as thing, so it'll tell you file not found. So dir shows you a, a, a directory, a folder. cd change to a directory. Technically, cd directory name. You type cd space the name of the directory, and you'll change into that directory. Question? On the Mac, it's not called command prompt, it's called terminal. Okay. Well, I entered the um, I entered the the slash dir mm -hmm. and enter and gave me command not found. But I think there was um mm -hmm. try uh, try forward slashes. I have to brush up on on my Mac um, commands because they're a little different. So uh, see me during during the break, okay. and we'll and I'll refresh my memory. And then we've got cd dot dot changes to the previous directory. cd space dot dot takes you back one level of a directory. And then this one I'll show you is optional, but for me it's useful because eventually I get a big wall of text that maybe annoys me. So sometimes I want to clear the screen. So if you type CLS, don't, don't type this yet. I'll type it and then you can do it if you want. CLS clears the screen. Maybe you don't want to lose all of that, so don't type it. But CLS clears your screen. Here's the screen. So uh, that also nukes your history, so then I don't have any more history to go back to. So that's why I said don't do it unless you want to clear the screen. But I do this sometimes just to kind of clean up the screen and so you can see it again. CLS, clear screen. So that's a, a couple of commands there. We'll talk about more, of course. I'll have them on a handout for you. I just wanted to do a quick introduction to a few of them at this point. Any questions so far? I guess the last one here is exit. You click exit and it closes the window. Or you can have close, of course click the little X and it exits it. Exits it. So our workflow is oftentimes we're going to use the command prompt to run a quick Cordova command and then it'll do something such as compile our app or even deploy it to a real device. When we're at the end of our project we would do Cordova build and then it would create all of the relevant versions. We could do Cordova run and it will run our app and so forth and debug it and all of that stuff. And so maybe they will create a graphical user interface version at some point. Right now it's command-based and a lot of times that's the most that's the quickest way. 
instead of hunting around in a particular app and what menu was it in and what button and what's that icon mean, you just remember that one command and type it and you're, and you're done. So it is a different paradigm than most of us are used to, but we'll learn just enough of it to do what we want. That was a segue from sheet number one. Let's go look at sheet number two. This is number two, Android Studio. <coughs> if you get this pop-up about reading untagged document, I don't know why that comes up, just cancel that. And if you have a sidebar that gets in your way over here, you can close it by clicking the tools item here that takes it out of the way. So we've installed Java, we've installed Ant. The other piece of the puzzle is Android Studio. Android Studio is the official software that allows us to create Android apps. It comes with the Android SDK tools, source code, emulated images, and much more. So this is the official code from Google to be able to create apps. It comes with its, with its own software to create apps. We'll take a look at this actually together. So notice there's a link here, developer.android.com. So you can click on it and it should then uh, open in the web browser. If it doesn't open right away, you might have to click OK. There we go. So you want to click on it. It'll open in the web browser. So this takes you over to developer.android.com. This is where, the, this is the developer's hub. This is all of the official Android stuff from Google. So Google is behind Android. Uh, if you look up on the history of Android, actually Google never really invented Android. They bought it from a company that was developing it. And, and then they, they bought it and then further developed it. So the original idea for Android came from uh, a smaller company. And Android was uh, was put out to the world in about I think 2008, a year and a, or a year and a half or so after the iPhone. The iPhone came out in 2007. So then um, the Android operating system was developed and published, and then the very first one, the I think it was called the Android G1, was this uh, really clunky um, uh, phone that had one of those remember those little um, keyboard things that phones used to have. So the first Android device had one of those, and then eventually it went to all touchscreen. Some of them even had one of those little spinning trackball things that you never see anymore. It's all touch now. But it's been uh, refined and improved throughout the years, and the current version is Android 5.1, I believe. Every few years a new version comes out, every few months a new version comes out, just like any software. We currently have Windows 7 on these computers. If you go buy a brand new computer, it's got Windows 8. At the end of this month, there'll be a brand new Windows version. If you haven't been paying attention, Windows 10 is coming out this month. What happened to Windows 9? Don't ask. So Mac OS 10, that's been different, had different versions for the past decade. And iOS, for the iPhone, it's had, it had version iOS 6, iOS 7, it's iOS 9 was just announced. So this stuff is always evolving. And right now, Android M, codename M, is the preview version. This will be either 5.5 or 6.0, or whatever it's going to be. But it's codenamed M. Because Google likes to use code names for their Android versions, and the code names always have to deal with sweets. There was Android Jelly Bean. There was Android um, Kit Kat. There was Android Donut. Eclair. It's all <coughs> alphabetical. Lollipop. A, B, C, D. So L, lollipop. M, the new one that's coming out. I don't know what it is. Macaroons or something. So you can either, uh, you can either refer to Android by the, the number such as Android 2.2, Android 5.1, Android 3.3, or the code name. And those are alphabetical. So Eclair, Donut, 
<laughs> and I don't remember them all. Uh, you can also refer to them as known as the API number. That's a number that is increasing from 1 to whatever. The current one is, I believe, 24. API 24. 23 or so. We can look it up. But anyway, Android now is the dominant operating system on mobile. It has, um, I think from last stat that I saw, it had like 70 or 80 percent market share. You think, how can that be if iPhone seems to be taking over the world? Well, iPhone perhaps has the largest mind share. Everyone wants an iPhone or, you know, for good and for bad, you know, uh, you may have strong positive or negative opinions of an iPhone, but you have to admit that the iPhone is the most profitable thing for Apple. It's Apple's the most profitable company in the history of humanity. They must be doing something right. But Android has a larger market share. It has hundreds of millions of devices worldwide. And the thing about it is we can download software to create Android apps for free. It's all on this site here. We can create apps for mobile, for tablets. What's this thing here? For TV. To give yourself the Google experience on your TV. To give yourself a smart TV if you don't have one. So the Google operating system is everywhere. It's even in cars and such. Android is everywhere. So we're going to be developing Android apps. And here through the developer portal, we have three main pillars. Design, develop, and distribute. Design is a lot of what we did in part one. Designing this app, putting the interface together, putting icons. Develop, we're going to focus most on this month. How to take that project and start to then prepare it and package it for Android distribution. And then distribute is going to be next month where we actually publish it to a real store and then promote it and update it and all of that. So all of the process from beginning to end to create an Android app, you don't take you don't need to take this class. Just read every single page from design, develop and distribute. And you'll be able to do it. <coughs> and so what do we have here? Build beautiful apps. You'll see training here, talking about the aesthetics of a modern Android app. Just like all software, it evolves also visually. It's not just what's under the hood. If you were using an iPhone, uh, you know, iOS 5 and 6, and then you updated to iOS 7, a lot of people went crazy because it changed so much. All the gradients went away, all of that shininess went away, and it became much flatter. And now iOS 7 and 8 and 9 continue that flat design. Same thing with Android. A couple of versions ago, it was very Tron like. It was gradients and glows and all of that cool stuff that was cool back then that now is like passe. And what's hot now, the current trend is this flat design, which they call material design. It's the aesthetic that makes an Android app look like an Android app, that makes an iPhone app look like an iPhone app, that makes a Windows app look like a Windows app. They all have their own aesthetic. You can learn all about that at the developer portal for uh, Android, for iPhone, for Windows. They've all got their own style. So everything that you ever wanted to learn about working with Android is here. What we'll need it for is we'll be referring to it here and there to read documentation and so forth because even if this class were three months long, five days a week, there's always still something to learn. And what you'll learn, what you'll be learning can come straight from the horse's mouth and other resources that I'll tell you. Because this stuff changes. Right now we're in the middle of getting Android M, the newest version. We'll be using the previous one, Android L, well the current one, Android L, which is, um, what is L again? JKL? Lollipop, yes. So we'll be using Lollipop 5.0. But uh, let's take a quick look at the develop screen at the top. Get started. Uh, set up Android Studio, build your first app, sample projects, etc. It's all here. Lots of tutorials, lots of training.
so. Um, and then divide it into a variety of sections, looking up the code and samples and everything. But what I want to do here is just to look at it. We're not going to download it because it's already set up on our computers. But at home, you don't have the software yet. That's what my instruction here is saying. You're going to go to developer.android. There's a download Android Studio for Windows or Mac. So what we've got here is if you click on set up Android Studio, it'll take you to this screen and what this will give you is the Android Studio IDE. And IDE is just the software that you use to write the code, to debug, to deploy your app and such. Another famous IDE. Anyone has it experience with? Another big one? It happens when the moon occults the Earth? Eclipse. So the Eclipse IDE is a very famous programming environment. Uh, and it used to be that we used Eclipse to create an Android app. And about a year ago or so, Google started to say, we're developing our own version, Android Studio. Here it is the beta test of it, the beta version. Because eventually, Android Studio will be the official way to make an Android app. And now it's official. So we don't use Eclipse anymore. You still could. But the official way to make uh, apps would be to use the Android Studio software. This download, don't download this because it's about 800 megabytes. But this download gives you the Android Studio code editor. It gives you the SDK tools, all the source code, the software development kit, all of the actual code that makes Android run. It gives you the latest version, 5.0 Lollipop. And it also gives you an emulator, so a virtual uh, Android device that runs on your computer. So that if you don't have a real device, you can test on the virtual device. All of that is with this 800 megabyte download. And that has an installation procedure. My instructions here basically say you download it. After you download, double click to install, select all components. Basically go through all defaults, but I do note one thing here. If you don't change this, it's okay. But this is changed on our computers. The default, it wants to install the Android Studio and the Android SDK inside your Programs folder, and it'll work if, if you do that. But because we're going to be in the command prompt, and it's a lot easier to type, you know, CDC Android SDK, then CDC backslash program files, blah, 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 the long path that it'll create for you. In my notes there, I'm recommending change that default when you get to it. When it asks you, where would you like to install the Android Studio? I recommend just put it on your C drive, top level, call it Android Studio. And it asks you, where would you like to put the SDK? Just put it on the top level again, your C drive. This will still work if you let it install in program files, or wherever it wants to install. But it'll be a little bit easier for you when you're typing in the command prompt. <coughs> you go through that, you let it install, it's going to do a few things. It'll then say, start Android Studio. I say, no, don't start it yet. Because we also need to add that to the path. The path that I've mentioned a few times now is just basically the listing of certain apps where they exist on your hard drive so that Cordova can find them. When we type Cordova build, it's going to search for your Android SDK. If it cannot find it, it cannot build your Android project. When you type Cordova build iOS, it's going to search where in your hard drive is the Android code. If it's not installed, then it won't create your Android project. So we tell it where the SDK is at where Java is at, where Ant is at, by setting this path. This is of course already done for us on these computers, but on your own computer, and this is for specifically for Windows. This works on Windows 8, Windows 7, Windows Vista, Windows XP, I suppose, Windows 10, I've tested it there too. Yes? The uh, Android uh, Big Bomb, if you download, that already includes SDK um, 
Yes, everything that I'm talking about so far is already installed, so you don't have to waste your time downloading it. It's already installed. But when you're at home, you'll have to do this. One thing that we will do right now is this part here. Set up the SDK. It's all downloaded, it's all installed, but it still needs a little setup. Especially if you go home. Because right now, as of right now, in these computers, we have this already set up, I believe, but when you go home, it'll be a little different. And it might not work exactly as what you see in this classroom unless you follow these instructions. So, we will actually do this part. It says, open C Android. You don't have to do this in the command prompt. We're going to do this in a plain old computer window. So let's do this. Open computer. Open the local disk C. C as in cat. Got a bunch of folders here. Open the Android SDK folder. Double click. We have a bunch of folders again. And then we've got AVD Manager and SDK Manager. Double click on SDK Manager. This is the Software Development Kit Manager. Double click that. Don't do uh, don't do what it's suggesting here yet. Don't let it update 19 packages. That'll be a waste of your time and our bandwidth. Because again, any changes that you make to these computers when you come back next time are gone. So you're wasting your time updating the software. On your own home computer, you might do this. What I would recommend, though, is while you're in the middle of a project, don't update the software. That could break your project. So if your environment, development environment is properly set up right now, work on your apps, finish it, publish it, and all of that. And then when it's time to do version 2 or 3 or 4 of the app, then do your research about what will these changes do to my app. I personally, when I work on apps, I don't update. I don't do these updates, most of them. They're going to break my app, probably. So if I'm in the middle of my app development process, I stay with what I have because it works. Those are what? Yeah, you're going to get some of these default values, and I'm going to explain them. Um, also, I'll my particular instructions here recommend what you should do. I'll get back to that in a moment. But let me explain what we're looking at here. This is the SDK manager. This, if you noticed at the very bottom, connected to the Google servers and downloaded what's the latest software. It didn't actually download the software, it's just a list of the software. And then what we see is a section here called Tools. And then we've got the Android SDK Build Tools. <coughs> version 19, 20, 21, 22, and 24. And then we've got Android SDK Platform Tools and Android SDK Tools. So, as I said, Android is evolving. There was Android 1.0 and now we're on 5.0. And it's also known as Android 1, uh, it's also known as API 1, 2, 3, 4, 12, 17, 24. And it's also known as Android, Jelly Bean, and Lima Key, Lime Pie, whatever. It's known by these code names as well. The point is that this is where we see all of the code where we can download and update it and, and everything. We do not have version 19 installed. We don't need it. We don't have 20 installed. We have 22 installed and 24. And it's telling us there's a brand new 24.3. We will not update any of this stuff here in this classroom. Again, it's a waste of time. It's just going to revert. When you download this at home, it'll look pretty much the same as this, but you'll probably already have version 24.3 because you're downloading the latest one. So this section on tools, these defaults, 
should be fine. You, you shouldn't have to do any of this at home. And this is the this is the tools that will allow us to convert our code into the actual Android app. I'm going to close the tools folder. There's also tools preview channel because a brand new version 23 release candidate 3 is available. You could download the latest bleeding edge version of the code and play with all the bugs. We're not going to need that, so I'm not going to touch that. And then also, then we've got these sections here: Android 5.1.1, Android code name M, Android 5.0.1, Android 4.4, 4.3, 4.0. We can go all the way back to Android 2.2. As I said, even Google themselves don't care about Android 1.0 anymore. The earliest that they care about is Android 2.2, API 8. So you know that's 20 versions ago. If we look in this section of Android M, we have a bunch of stuff here. Uh, I'm going to skip this for the moment because it's still preview stuff, too experimental for us. So I'm going to close Android M and I'm going to look at Android 5.1.1, API 22. So there's some things that are already installed, some things that are not installed, and some things that it's recommending to install. Well, how do you know what to do? It's in my instructions. Double click on that, open it up. Under Android 5.1.1, turn on the check mark for SDK platform. This is if you're doing this at home. This is already done here. You're going to turn on the check mark for SDK platform. Google API, Google API Intel x86 image, and sources for SDK. Under Extras, turn on Android Support Library. Uh, actually, first I say turn off all the check marks. So first at home when you go home, I'm saying turn off all the check marks, and then turn on these ones. Just five of them. What's the question? My instructions here say that you're going to turn off all the check marks everywhere, and then there's a section that tells you what to turn on under extras, number five. So on our computers here, we're not going to need to do any of this stuff. It's done. And what we're doing here is we're downloading the code for Android, you know, whatever. And we're downloading the system image to create a virtual device, according to my sheets, my instructions. Even if you have a real device, you still sometimes want to create virtual devices, because I want to test my app on a tablet. And I'm not going to go buy a tablet just to test my app. Maybe I can find a good deal on one. Hopefully it's $100 or less. But good luck finding a good tablet for that price. And what I mean by good is not one of these weird, cheap tablets that you can get at, you know, CVS. Uh, so even though I've got a good phone, maybe I want to test my project on a tablet. So I still would want to create a virtual device. And we'll talk about how to do that soon. But that's what this stuff is, so that you can create a, a virtual device. You can create a virtual Android TV device. So you can have like a, like a virtual television inside, your, um, inside your, your computer. And back when everyone cared about it, uh, back over here in Android 4.4 or so, uh, you could have downloaded the Google Glass development software as well. Notice it's gone now. I guess it wasn't a big hit. And then also we've got Android Wear for, uh, you know, uh, watches. It's all being integrated now with the latest versions. So in this room, you don't have to do any of this. At home, follow those instructions to be on the right track. You don't need to install the software for any earlier versions because our newest version will still be backwards compatible to a degree. 
And then under extras, my, my instructions there mention a couple of things to turn on and off. One of them is uh, the Intel x86 emulator accelerator. This is most relevant to you if you are creating virtual devices. Because even if you've got one of these little things in your pocket, to run it in a regular computer is actually pretty exhausting to the computer. Even if you've got a big old, you know, i7 computer with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a 2 terabyte hard drive, this little thing is still going to cause it to, to, to stutter a little bit. It's because it's different architecture. Most likely, you have an Intel CPU. This is running a different kind of CPU. It's a different language and different instructions. So it might be slower than you would think. Why? I've got an i7 fourth generation 16 gigs of RAM, and this thing in my pocket right now has 2 gigabytes running at 1 gigahertz. How come my i7 can't handle it? Because it's a different kind of brain. It's a different kind of uh, instruction set and so forth. With this accelerator, that helps you run the virtual device a lot smoother. This is all already set up. We should be fine. But the point of this screen is that you at your house, you would do your updates. You would follow my instructions to, to find out what do I turn on, what do I turn off. Short answer, the short answer is turn everything off and only turn on these five things I'm saying. Any general questions about the SDK manager? All the defaults should work for us in this room. Unfortunately, the default that's what I was about to say. Unfortunately, the defaults perhaps might not be the best. So check out my recommendations there and follow those, and then you can decide to add to it. Because Android development, we're going to see, unfortunately, there's still a lot of rough edges. Even though it's a mature platform and everything, you're going to see rough edges here and there. Because it's Android, the great thing about Android is that because it's open source, anyone can develop for it and change it. The bad thing about Android is anyone can develop for it and make changes to it. And so things change, things get forked, things uh, go out of sync, and you see some rough around the edges stuff once in a while. So uh, that's why I have all of these instructions that try to keep you on track. In this class we were, we're not really going to need to do anything with the SDK manager, so just close it. We're going to do one thing, then we'll take a break. Even if you've got a real device, like I said, how many of you brought your cable? Almost no one. So we're going to create... Yes? Okay, can you pass it to everyone in the classroom? Okay. So what we're going to do before we take our break is we're going to create a virtual device. I've got instructions right here. So if you don't have a real device, you can run virtual devices that emulate the experience. AVDs are limited, however, in some features. Like your computer's not going to vibrate when you activate the vibrate feature. Uh, GPS is a bit weird also, so a real device is often better to work with. But we'll talk about creating a virtual device now. If you're still in that Android SDK folder, we have AVD Manager, Android Virtual Device Manager. Double-click that. You can have as many virtual <coughs> devices as you want. You're limited by your hard drive space. Each one takes up about 500 megabytes or more because it's running a whole, a whole phone on your computer. Um, you can run as many as you want at once, technically, but if you've got like 3 gigs of RAM <coughs> on your computer, you're going to have a hard time running one because a lot of that RAM is going to be used just for your computer plus the RAM that this little guy's going to take. So if you've got 16 gigs of RAM, yeah, you could run three virtual devices, one phone and two tablets, sure. Um, but these take up a lot of resources as well, even though they fit in your pocket. But here in the Virtual Device Manager, I don't have any devices yet, but I have these templates. 
So at the top, click on device definitions. Here's a template for making a TV. It's going to be 1920 by 1080. Or you can have a template to make a little Android Wear device. It's going to be 320 by 320. Or a Nexus tablet, 720 by 1280 pixels. Well, just to test this out, according to my instructions, we're going to scroll down to find the one called 3.2 inch QVGA ADP2 generic. It's going to be a little old 3.2 inch screen, 320 by 480 pixels, 512 megs of RAM. So once you find the 3.2 QVGA ADP2, not the 3.2 slider, that's the one that's going to have the slide out keyboard, those don't even exist anymore. Click on that once to select it, and then on the right side click Create AVD. Create AVD. This pops up for you to fill in a few details, most of it's already filled in such as the name of a device. So if I've got seven devices, I can give them seven names. Maybe I'm creating a low-powered device, a medium-powered device, and a high-powered device. So I can give them different names. Because I used one of these templates, it already chose a device and probably a target. You can still go in and change that, but don't. What we do want to change is under Target, choose the Google API. Under CPU, we should have the Google API Intel Atom CPU. If it doesn't let you choose a CPU, make sure you change your target to Google. It's going to be annoying to try to type stuff on this virtual screen because we don't have touch screens. So we have a keyboard, however. If we leave on hardware keyboard, keyboard present, we'll be able to type right on our keyboard, and it'll show up on the little virtual device. Under Skin, select the first one, Skin with Dynamic Hardware Controls. A real device has a, has a screen, but it also has volume buttons, power button, maybe some other buttons. Like this one over here has a physical home button. My newer one over here doesn't. It's a virtual one on the screen. Right there. But here we're saying, don't just give me a screen. Give me hardware controls. Give me the power button, the volume button, etc. This particular older device emulates an older device that did not have a front-facing camera like this older one I have here. This didn't have a front-facing camera, so taking selfies was hard. Uh, these newer ones, of course, have a front-facing. But here, I, I cannot choose front-facing. I only have back camera. The cool thing is, especially if you're on a laptop, because most laptops have a little webcam, you can say, use the webcam of my computer. So we'll be able to test the camera capabilities in your virtual device. It'll just tap into your real camera. You guys don't have cameras on these computers, so you can select Emulated. It'll be like a fake camera that kind of acts like it takes a photo, so that when we talk about taking a photo in our app, we can test that. Again, everything that I'm saying is in this sheet. Memory. Leave the default 512 megs and 16 megs VM heap. Don't worry about that. Internal storage, it has 200 uh, megabytes. Don't worry, you don't need a gigabyte space in here. 200 is fine. We're going to put in a virtual SD card. If we take photos, they need to be saved into the SD card. We'll create a virtual one. Any size matters, but just because my hand is, is near it, I just type 99. Doesn't matter. A 99 megabyte SD card, you can't even buy those. Doesn't matter. And then these emulation options. Um, when you test this at home, you can, you're going to want to compare with what we're about to do right now. 
as in is it how responsive is it if I swipe between screens is it as responsible as this computer when I launch my app does it go slowly does it stutter if your home setup is not as responsive as you would like it might help you to turn on use host GPU because then it'll tap into your graphics processor to speed up your virtual device a little bit more we don't seem to need it on these computers, so I'm not going to turn it on. But when you test this on your own computer at home, and it's not as fast as you would like, that might help you. Snapshots are that we can be working on our virtual device, create a snapshot, and it sort of freezes your device at a certain point, then you can mess with it, break things, and whoops, I have to undo that, so we can revert to a snapshot. So we can set snapshots to save our progress to some, to some degree. Um, we're not going to need that just yet, so I did not turn on any of these just yet. Click OK. It's going to process that, and it may take a moment, because it's creating a little computer in your computer. Mine says not responding, respond. yes. Just keep waiting a little bit more. Hopefully, eventually, you get a pop-up that says, this is what you just did. You created a virtual device, blah, 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 blah. Fine. Click OK. And that kicks us back to the Android Virtual Device tab. We've got one virtual device. Select it there, and then click Start on the right. We're going to turn on the virtual device. But first, it, uh, it asks you to check a couple of things. These defaults are fine. If you're running on your own home computer, you're going to use this virtual device, and it'll be like a real device. And it, if you browse the internet, it'll remember that. If you install an app, it'll remember that. It'll be like a real Android device in your computer. If you then want to kind of reset it back to factory settings, we have wipe user data. If you want to scale this to display to the real size, if you actually want to see it in three and a half inches right on your screen, you can activate that. Not, we're not going to do that. And if we were using snapshots, we can create a snapshot at this point. We can revert a snapshot. We're not going to change anything here, just click launch. This will pop up that it'll say it's starting the virtual device. Just for your edification, I'm going to pull up my um, resource monitor to show you how my computer is going to stress to run this device. Eventually, You'll see a brand new item appear down here. Mine hasn't come up yet. But eventually you'll see a new item pop up. There's my RAM there. There's my CPU. Did you see that? This device appeared here. A new, a new program appeared down here. This is launching. There's my RAM that jumped up there. My CPU is processing. I'm getting this splash screen, this glowing Android splash screen. Eventually, then it'll fully boot up. Look at that core really struggling there. We're chugging along. Eventually, you'll get to a screen. Has anyone gotten past this screen? A few people? Okay, just keep waiting. Um, I'm going to close a few of these things I don't need open because I am running lots of things and it might slow me down. We we'll just keep waiting a moment. <coughs> we 
give you a moment. Okay, eventually it will show you time. Right, so this is, if you're not quite there, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, it, it booted up. It went to the start screen like a, like a device. And then it says it's charging. And then um, if I want to unlock my real device, I swipe it up, right? You have to swipe it up also on yours. We do not have touch screens, so don't touch the screen. You're going to use a mouse, and you're going to click and hold and drag up just like you would swipe up on a device. This is a brand new device out of the box. It says, make yourself at home. To see all your apps, tap the circle. Just click OK. So imagine you're tapping this on a real device. So tap it with the mouse. We have a home screen. Just like on this device here, I can swipe over to see my other screens. I can tap and hold and drag to swipe my virtual desktops. Tap and hold and swipe over. You can tap, just like on my device right in the middle, I have my apps. I click that. Tap on that apps drawer right there. That pops open all your apps, and it says choose some apps. Just tap OK. These are different apps. Tap and drag over. There's a few more apps. On my device here, if I want to go back home, I press the home button, which is a circle. If I want to go home on my virtual device, I've got a home button. Tap the home button, it goes back to the home screen. On the home screen here, I've got the phone, contacts, messages, web browser. Tap the web browser. This launches the default web browser. Just like I've got here, web browser, tap it launches. Here it's going to connect to the real internet. It's using your computer's internet connection. So if here on Google I type, if I do some search, I can use my keyboard here. That's why I told it use a use hardware keyboard. So I can actually type here. And that's searching the real internet. So the scroll wheel will not work here, obviously. This is a Android device. You have to tap and hold and scroll, like you would tap and hold and scroll on a device. You can share your location if you want. I'm just going to get it out of the way. I'll say, yeah, share location. I'm going to click the home button to go back home and we don't really have a lot of apps here it's just a virtual device straight out of the, the factory we have Google Maps and so forth um, you know we have the phone dialer this is not going to place a real phone call but we can you know emulate this um, right? it's called Domino's Pizza We've got the text app and so forth. So it's a real device. I thought I was calling someone for real. <laughs> <laughs> wow, they've really improved their virtual devices. Uh, so you might have a real device, but if you if you don't, we're going to be using virtual devices. You might have a real device, but we can create a tablet virtual device to test our apps. Notice with this rinky-dink 3.2-inch medium low-quality device, look at what my CPU is doing and how much RAM I've used and so forth. So if I'm trying to make a more powerful device, remember, if I'm trying to make a device that itself uses 2 gigs of RAM and my computer has 3, it's going to be bad news 
you're not going to be able to run it very well or at all because Windows itself, your Mac itself, needs a bunch of RAM. Now you've got a, a whole new virtual computer in your computer. So we're going to take a break and what you could do is if you would like to in the AVD manager you can play with creating a different virtual device. You can go back to the device definitions and see well, what does the Android Wear look like or what does the Android TV look like or what does a 10 inch tablet look like. The one that we're going to use in this class is the one that I have in my instructions. This 3.2 inch one. If you'd like to create any other device you can but we're going to use this basic one. So if you got up to this point, great. We're, we're well on our way. If you didn't, call me over and I'll get you caught up. We're going to take a break of 10 minutes between 8.36 and 8.46. So we'll be back. I'll turn the printer back on if you want to print and we'll, and we'll go on.